uh, but we're here for, for some business. You are uh, in Texas politics courses, and uh, at SMU I teach uh, American government and Texas politics uh, most semesters, and uh, because I've been teaching it for a number of years, I've, I've written a, a couple of books about it, uh, one of which uh, most recently, about a year and a half ago, is called Lone Star Tarnished, a critical look at Texas politics and public policy. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to talk about that book and, and start by talking a little bit about why I wrote it, and I think you might be able to, uh, to identify with this. Uh, Texas politics is very easy to understand if you don't think much about it, uh, because there is a legend. There's a mythology of, uh, of Texas, that it is uh, a state built on uh, small government, low taxes, personal responsibility, grit, gumption, uh, and that, uh, uh, that it has made of itself uh, the leading state in the nation, that other, the other 49 states would be well advised to follow the Texas model, uh, as would the United States. But if you think a little more deeply about Texas, it becomes more complicated. And, uh, and so uh, I, I perhaps remain confused, and I'm going to try to work through some of, that, uh, some of that complexity and confusion with you today. It started uh, with the newspapers. If you read the business pages of the Dallas Morning News, which I have done for 19 years now since I came to SMU, and I, uh, I started teaching over at uh, LSU in Baton Rouge and then went up to the University of Colorado in Boulder. So it's not just 19 years, it's about 35 now. But since I got to uh, Dallas, I've been reading the Dallas Morning News. And if you read the business section of the Dallas Morning News, it is a story of triumph. Uh, one triumph after another, sort of better job creation than any other state uh, in the nation. More people moving to Texas. Uh, than anywhere else in the nation. Just within the last week, there was a story about Texas reaching the national average on median household income. But job growth and population growth is the key to the Texas miracle story, that uh, the growth of jobs in Texas and people coming to find those jobs suggest that Texas is doing something right, and people are voting with their feet, leaving California and Michigan and New York and Connecticut high-tax states uh, to come to Texas. So the business pages glow uh, about the Texas miracle. But if you read the front news section of the Dallas Morning News, you see story after story about, uh, uh, about education and health care and transportation and prisons so that Texas is 49th among the 50 states and the District of Columbia in per capita student funding. 49th in the nation in per capita student funding. It has the highest rate of uninsured people uh, of any state in the nation. It's got the largest prison population of any state in the nation, including California, which is half again as big and it can't fund maintenance on its roads, let alone construction of new highways, even in the face of that population growth. So if you read the news sections, uh, there are a series of stories about problems in education and in access uh, to health care, particularly for the mentally uh, afflicted and a whole series of other policy areas. So the reason I wrote this book is to try to get a sense of what the relationship is between uh, population and job growth and economic performance in general and these social service performance indicators like education, access to health care, uh, support for the mentally impaired and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so to figure out why the newspaper was uh, so different in its various sections sort of set me on my way. And so the basic question is, how well is Texas doing today? And I want to say, first of all, this, this subtitle, A Critical Look at Texas Politics and Public Policy. Critical means something a little different in normal conversation than it does uh, for college teachers and academics. In normal conversation, it, it might mean 
pouring in on something negative about it, critical of it. But for uh, professors and academics, that also means analytical, looking closely, trying to parse the facts, to sort things out and get as good and accurate a view as possible. And that's what I've uh, tried to do in that book. But the general question is, how well is Texas doing? And the broad answer is not as well as you would think. In a whole range of areas, including income, education, access to health care, and social services, despite the Texas miracle rhetoric, uh, Texas has made no progress against the national average in many of those areas since 1950. Over the last 60 years, Texas has not moved up in a comparison with other states in various measures of educational performance, access to health care, uh, and, uh, and uh, a number of other uh, policy areas. And what that means is that uh, as Texas has gotten wealthier, other states have gotten wealthier as well. And if they haven't gotten wealthier quite as fast as Texas, they have spent more money on those social services than Texas, so Texas's position remains steady. It is surprising to a great many people to say that Texas has not moved up in comparison with the other states in education and healthcare and all those other social services since 1950, but as I'll show you, uh, that is the case. So let's talk a little bit about how Texas thinks about itself. There's something called the Texas model or the Texas way. The Texas miracle is another phrase used to describe how Texas is doing. And the Texas model uh, for government and for the relationship between government, society, and the economy has four pillars. One of them, and these four pillars have been in place since the Republic of Texas, since all the way back to Sam Houston and then straight forward. They are small government, a dedication to personal freedom and therefore to keeping government small so individuals are able to make more of the choices uh, available for themselves and government isn't uh, uh, a nanny state making their decisions for them. So small government is one of Texas's calling cards. Another is low taxes. Uh, Texas uh, doesn't have an income tax uh, it does have property taxes and sales taxes, and those are pretty high compared to other states. But Texas takes uh, only 72% as much in tax revenue as does the average state. So Texas is a low tax state. It always ranks be between 44 and 49, meaning that 45 to 48 or 49 states tax at a higher rate than Texas does. So small government, low taxes, uh, deregulation. Deregulation is another part of leading, leaving choices uh, to individuals and particularly to business owners. Uh, limited regulation is a dedication to the idea that people will generally do the right thing and market forces will lead companies to make responsible choices. Now sometimes, a fertilizer plant in West, small city in Central Texas, blows up. And people say, well, you know, if you had had more serious stringent regulation, if you'd had inspectors out there at this fertilizer plant, they would have discovered shortcomings. It would not have resulted in this disastrous uh, problem. But over the long haul and in general, Texas is dedicated to the idea that less regulation is better than more regulation because it leaves businesses free to expand, to hire, to grow with the owners keeping more of the profits and raising wages to their workers. If you drive costs into business for regulatory response, then you don't have that for profits and you don't have it for wages. So there is an argument for, uh, for deregulation as well. Uh, so small government, low taxes, deregulation, and a heavy emphasis on personal responsibility, meaning that 
if government is going to be small and taxes are low, you're not going to have a lot of social services. So people need to understand that they are responsible for taking care of themselves, for getting ready to be successful in life, doing well in school, going to community college, moving on, getting a job, working hard in it. If you lose that job, uh, you might look to uh, unemployment compensation in the short term, but, but you're responsible for getting back out there and getting after it, sort of picking yourself up, dusting yourself off, and going for it. So that's generally the, the Texas model. Small government, low taxes, a non-intrusive government, meaning light regulation and personal responsibility, where individuals are responsible for taking care of themselves and not looking to, uh, to the state of Texas. I'm going to now read you two quotes from Governor Rick Perry, uh, who uh, uh, has been governor of Texas since late 2000, longest serving governor in the history of Texas uh, and the longest serving governor bar only a couple in the history of the country. So he has been uh, elected by Texans to lead the state four different times. And what makes Rick Perry such an effective Texas politician is that he seems positively pained, near tears, by any criticism of the state of Texas. His campaigns are essentially, I love Texas, and I have tried to to lead Texas to its continuing prosperity, and I want to continue to do that. And any opponent, whether it's Kay Bailey Hutchison uh, or some Democrat opponent who challenges how Texas is doing in education or some other policy area, Rick Perry will say, you're tearing down Texas, and I love Texas. Uh, it breaks my heart that you're doing that. And people have returned him to governor's office uh, four times. So he channels the Texas model and the Texas myth as effectively as anyone does. One of the things that uh, Rick Perry said in his 2010 book, Fed Up, so whenever you're thinking of running for president, you write a book to sort of lay out your values, your philosophy, your policy positions. Uh, and Rick Perry's book was entitled Fed Up, by which he meant he's fed up with everything outside of Texas. Uh, particularly everything in Washington, and he wants to describe how Washington, if it would become more like Texas, would be a much more effective, uh, responsible, uh, fiscally responsible national government. And so two things from Rick Perry. This is from his book, Fed Up. We in Texas are proud that so many of our fellow Americans have sought relief from heavy taxation and burdens in our sister states to move to our state in search of a freer, fairer climate in which to conduct business and live their lives. That sort of distilled Texas, that people are moving to Texas, voting with their feet, because they're so overtaxed and overregulated in other parts of the country that they're fleeing to freedom in Texas. And he says, but keep in mind that there is a reason people want to come here. We are doing something right, and that is making Texas an attractive place. So pardon us if we don't care to change our ways to mirror New York, California, or Michigan. And about a year ago, Rick Perry went to New York and Connecticut to try to recruit businesses to Texas and argued that Texas was a far better business climate than is Connecticut and businesses would be well advised uh, to relocate. Connecticut is the wealthiest state on average in America. And Texas is below the national average in per capita wealth. So the question is, what, what did Perry mean that Texas is a friendlier business climate and people would be well advised to leave Connecticut to come to Texas? It's that freedom theme, that in Texas, you're free to start a business, build a business, make it thrive, and enjoy the benefits. While you can do all that in Connecticut, the taxes on your business are going to be 50% or more higher. Uh, there are going to be lots of regulations on hiring and firing and running your business. And so the argument is not that Texas is the wealthiest state by any means, but that it's the freest state uh, and people come to Texas to enjoy that freedom. Second thing I want to mention to you from Rick Perry 
uh, is from his 2011 inaugural address. Uh, this is his last inaugural address. He'll leave office uh, uh, after the gubernatorial election in November 2014. So by January uh, of 2015, we'll, uh, we'll have a new governor. But this is Rick Perry in his 2011 inaugural address. And there are two parts to this. He says, as Texans, we always take care of the least among us. That's the idea that as Texans, we take care of people who are struggling, people who can't work through no fault of their own. Maybe you have mental or physical disabilities. Maybe they're between jobs. Uh, maybe they are simply uh, 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 unable to take care of themselves. So as Texans, we always take care of the least among us. This is the second part. We will protect them, but cannot risk the future of millions of taxpayers in the process. We must cut spending to keep our economic engine on track. So two thoughts. One, as Texans, we're compassionate. We always take care of those among us who are needy. But in doing that, we can't permit programs to become so expensive that they require taxes to rise because that money comes out of the pockets of every other Texan and would dampen the climate of business growth and advancement. So he says that we take care of people but cannot risk the future of millions of taxpayers in the process. We must cut spending to keep our economic engine on track and that's what Texas did as you know during the uh, recent uh, economic collapse, the difficulties uh, that we face as a country between uh, 2008 and today when we still have relatively high unemployment rates but uh, uh, not nearly as high as they used to be. So Texas takes the view that while it's important to have programs in place to help people in need, those programs really do have to be kept as sparse as they can be so they don't become a drag on the economy uh, and uh, detract from people's ability uh, to, uh, uh, to get jobs, uh, to increase their income, to start businesses, and to enjoy the profits of those businesses. Uh, so Texas has always stood for these uh, pillars under the Texas model, small government, low taxes, deregulation, and personal responsibility. But that model was built uh, early in Texas history and has uh, been sustained throughout uh, the history of the state. So I want to go back a little bit and talk about the history of Texas uh, before I jump up and talk about some of the, the fundamental programs in Texas. The first uh, is to uh, uh, you know, talk about graduation rates and, and income and as you can see, this is Anglo, Black, and Hispanic. Uh, Asian population we'll talk a little bit about, but it's a relatively recent population in Texas. So we'll hit this in a bit, hit income in a bit. Let me talk about this a little bit right now. Texas is undergoing very dramatic uh, demographic change. Demographic change, uh, demography is the study of the character of populations, the, the, uh, the description of populations by race, ethnicity, gender, income, educational attainment, all kinds of different uh, characteristics. And the demography or the character of the population of Texas has changed dramatically over the years and is continuing to change uh, in very dramatic ways. Uh, and this demographic change, if you were to go back uh, to 1870, uh, it is uh, about 65% Anglo, 30% Black, uh, and about 5% uh, Hispanic. So Texas before the Republic uh, is part of, uh, of Mexico. The population is generally Spanish and Mexican with Anglos beginning to move in and just a trickle uh, in the uh, 1820s, uh, early 1830s, and beginning in the 1830s, starting to bring some slaves. 
uh, and by the time of the Civil War and the end of slavery, right after the Civil War in 1870, Texas was an Anglo state uh, with a black population, former slaves, uh, at 30%. It had actually been 25% back in 1860, but during the war, some slave owners from like Alabama and Mississippi where there was heavy fighting brought blacks to Texas. So it's 30% by 1870, 20% by 1900, 12 by 2000, moving toward 10 in 2050. So what I want you to just look at that and see is the dramatic change in the makeup of the Texas population by race and ethnicity uh, from its early stages when Texas was an Anglo Republic. It was a republic or a state after it came into the Union built by and for Anglos uh, with uh, uh, ethnic minorities either being enslaved or run off to the maximum extent possible. So Anglos are 65 to 75 percent going up toward 80 percent of the population around the beginning of the 20th century but then the Anglo portion of the population begins to decline and in the 2000 census Anglos were 50 percent and this is the surprising number by 2050 the Texas State Data Center which is a state run demography outfit at the University uh, UT San Antonio uh, projects that Anglos will be 28 percent of uh, the population of the state of Texas. So going from 75, 80 percent at the beginning of the 20th century to 28 percent by the middle of the 21st century, which is 35 years from now, not that long. Uh, that is a dramatic uh, change in Texas. Blacks will go from 30 percent right after the Civil War to 20 at the beginning of the 20th century uh, 12 now uh, going toward 10. This number declined as rapidly as it did for a couple of reasons. After the Civil War, the whites coming to Texas could no longer bring slaves, but the racial dynamics, the racial atmosphere in Texas was such that a lot of blacks left uh, right after the Civil War and all the way for the next hundred years. So this is an out migration at least to some extent, and a, a minor in-migration uh, back into the South in Texas since 1970, but blacks will be 10% of the state's population uh, by 2050. And Hispanics, although Texas was part of Mexico early, after the Texas Revolution succeeded uh, in 1836, and Texas became a state in 1845, in that decade, there was a strong Anglo push to move Hispanics uh, out of most of Texas, below the Nueces River, about 100 miles up from the Rio Grande, or beyond the Rio Grande back into Mexico. So there was a, uh, a legal uh, and a, uh, a, a, a violent attempt uh, to move Hispanics uh, out of Texas. Uh, so by 1870, about 5%. 5% at the beginning of the 20th century, 32% of Texans by 2000. That number is 38, 39 uh, today, and 54% by, uh, by 2050. Now, demographic change is interesting, but inconsequential, unimportant, of no meaning if everybody in the population has the same educational attainment and earning power. If Anglos, Blacks, and Hispanics all had the same educational attainment levels and the same incomes, this would make no difference at all. None. Because although the numbers are moving around in a dramatic way from heavily Anglo to an Anglo minority of just a little more than a quarter and Hispanic majority of uh, 54 percent, those dramatic changes would make no difference at all if Anglos, Blacks, and Hispanics had the same educational level, the same income levels. But they don't. And so as you move from where we are now uh, to through the next several decades, 
one of the great challenges to the state of Texas and to citizens, individuals in Texas, because neither the state or individuals can do this alone. But these graduation rates from high school and other educational attainment uh, measures like SAT scores, those kinds of things, uh, uh, become critical because currently about 92% of Anglos uh, graduate from high school. There are tests at the end of high school, right? About 5% or so fail those tests and don't get a degree. Uh, but about 92% uh, of Anglos graduate from high school, uh, and about half of those go on to college. Uh, about 86% of blacks uh, graduate from high school. About 60% of Hispanics currently in the workforce don't have a high school diploma. So let me say that a little bit differently. The, these are not just high school graduation rates. These are uh, the uh, proportion of these demographic groups in the workforce that have a high school degree. 92% of Anglos do, 86% of blacks do, and 60% of Hispanics do, meaning that 40% of Hispanics don't have a high school education. And it's more than 40% for Hispanics that uh, have immigrated into the country legally or illegally. Texas Hispanics have a somewhat higher number, but the Hispanic presence in the workforce 40% don't have uh, a high school degree. And that is a pretty direct transfer, right, from educational attainment uh, to, uh, this is median family income, sort of average family income uh, in Texas. Anglos, Anglo families average $78,388. Black families average, and I think this is black families average forty-four thousand two hundred and eighty-two dollars, and Hispanics average forty-one thousand one hundred and fifty-one dollars. Uh, blacks make fifty-seven percent of what Anglo's do, and Hispanics make fifty-two percent uh, of what Anglo's do. So. The fundamental issue confronting Texas over the course of the next several decades is whether or not these educational attainment rates change. Especially among Hispanics, because the black population, while important, uh, is shrinking as a total uh, uh, share of the population in Texas the Hispanic population is growing rapidly, heading toward uh, majority status at 54% by, by 2050. So because the Hispanic population is growing so rapidly, educational attainment among Hispanics is critical and will require individuals, Anglos, Blacks, and Hispanics, uh, to focus on education uh, and to become uh, laser-like in that focus to raise the educational attainment of the Texas population in general going forward so that these lower incomes currently in place shift up and become more like Anglo incomes. There is a danger uh, in here, right? These are Minority Texans, right? Blacks have a uh, high school graduation rate uh, that is a little bit below Anglos, but an income that is substantially below Anglos. So the idea that just improving your educational attainment is going to lead to those higher incomes, you have to sort of figure that out. Why the educational attainment for blacks has gone up, but the incomes have not gone up dramatically in response. When you look at Hispanic educational attainment levels and say it is critical that Hispanics improve their educational standing, larger numbers graduating from high school, larger numbers still going on to college uh, and going on beyond college to professional 
uh, and graduate uh, training. On my way down here this morning, I was listening to KERA 90.1, uh, and I, I suppose all of you were too. And there was a story on it that 50% of jobs open in Dallas today require a BA. And that only about 30% of people living in the Dallas area have a BA. So it's a mismatch between what jobs are requiring and the educational attainment uh, that, that people have requiring everybody, Anglos, Blacks, and Hispanics, to improve their educational attainment so that they are qualified for those good, what they call STEM jobs, right? Those good technology kinds of jobs because they pay up here at that, uh, that level as opposed to, you know, hard, often physical work jobs uh, that, that pay less. As educational attainment goes up, presumably these uh, incomes by race and ethnicity go up as well. And the key thing to recognize is, and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, well, I'll save that for just a minute. The key thing to recognize is that if you have 75% of your population in the high wage category, that is way cool. That's great. It doesn't get any better than that. If three quarters over here, of your population has a high average wage, uh, that's very, very good. But if a little more than a quarter of your population has high average wages, and more than half of your population has low average wages, in other words, if these proportions don't change over the next several decades, you're in a situation that will see a 20% decline uh, in average median family income in Texas because you've got a much bigger proportion of your population making low wages and a much smaller proportion of your population making high wages so the average wage has to come down. It's simple math. And what I was going to tell you before is simple math is going to be about what many Texas high school graduates will be able to do in the future years because there is today a vote in the Texas Education Agency uh, to take out Algebra 2 and a bunch of other higher math uh, from the required high school curriculum. The other thing that's going on in Texas is that there is a school funding case uh, in the Austin courtroom uh, of District Judge John Dietz. Uh, and it is a case in which 600 Texas school districts are suing the state of Texas, claiming that they are providing inadequate and inequitable funding for Texas schools. And the state, although they're providing 49th in the country in per capita student spending, is in court saying, no, that's plenty. We're spending as much as we need to on, uh, on uh, education in the state. The school districts will win. There's no question about it. School districts have sued Texas eight times since 1989, and they've won seven of them. Because legislators, because of that small government, low taxes, deregulation uh, set of uh, pillars for the, the Texas model, say, uh, you know, we can't afford to uh, spend more on education. It would mean we have to raise taxes, and that would dampen uh, this business climate that we have, so you're going to have to get by on 49%. Besides, we think there's a lot of waste in public education. If you spent that money more widely, wisely, there would be plenty of it. Judge Dietz will not uh, accept that argument. Uh, the state courts, including the Texas Supreme Court, in seven out of eight school funding cases over the last quarter century, have found for the schools and ordered the state legislature and governor to spend more money. This is perfect for the elected officials because they can say, we didn't want to do it. The courts found that what we were doing was unconstitutional, told us we had to spend more. So it's not our fault. The judge made us do it. Uh, so watch that, that case. And think about the fact that Texas is 49th in per capita student funding 
and the state of Texas is in court fighting not to have to spend any more. And then think for just a minute about how critical this is. I mean, this absolutely has to change if Texas is going to thrive. It absolutely must. Because Texas, for a long time, thrived having a two-tier economy, a sort of upper-tier Anglo economy where people were doing pretty well, and a lower-tier black and Hispanic economy that was a low-wage workforce. Uh, so for most of this time, uh, that uh, worked reasonably well because, for Anglos at least, because they were a large portion of the population. That strategy cannot work when your low-wage workers are a big majority. Add these up and you're approaching two-thirds, right, uh, of your workforce. So this has to change. Texas, the state, is doing little, which puts a tremendous responsibility on each one of you, right? Because you have to sort of rise up uh, and gain all the education that you can possibly gain on your own with a little, not very much help from the state of Texas in order that these numbers will change uh, and Texas will thrive in the middle of the 21st century. And Texas will continue to thrive if it has an educated workforce making good middle class and upper middle class jobs, Texas will not thrive. If that doesn't happen, if these proportions remain the same, but the demographic change that is predicted continues, Texas will be a poorer, less productive state uh, than it is today. Uh, and we'll see how that goes. So that's what that book is about. That book is an attempt to lay out as clearly as you can, the best available data on how well Texas is actually doing in a whole range of policy areas. And the answer is very well in a few, uh, not so well in others, and very, very poorly in a wide range of areas, some of which must change if this, uh, uh, if this uh, description of the Texas future uh, that I have offered uh, is to be avoided. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. I would be happy to hear uh, questions and happy to respond to them, but not just questions. Uh, I think alternative perspectives, anything you think uh, in response to what I've said this morning, I'd be happy to hear uh, and to respond to or just to uh, 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 apologize for my errors uh, and uh, uh, agree with you. So any questions? Yes, sir. Is there a state you should model ourselves more like that's out there, like a, a better state, better helping the wealthy? Yeah, uh, uh, not, a, not a state so much as a, as a region. Uh, this, uh, as part of that book, I, I talk about the Texas tax structure and what kind of taxes might be available to raise and how far you would be able to raise them without effective affecting Texas competitors. That's the key thing. The Texas model says because we have low taxes, small government deregulation, uh, you get to keep more of the profits that you make uh, from your business or the wages uh, that you earn. And so we don't want to become uh, Connecticut uh, because Connecticut is a high tax state uh, and Connecticut has all the major insurance companies uh, in the country. New York has all the big banks. That's the money center of the country and has been throughout its history. We're in the periphery uh, of the country. But if you look at the 14 southern states, from Virginia uh, around uh, to, uh, to uh, Louisiana, uh, they take in tax revenue 90% of the national average. We take in tax revenue 75% of the national average. So we could go from 75 up to 80, 82, something like that, and still be below virtually all the rest of the southern states on tax burden and therefore not be less competitive. Businesses looking for a good business low tax environment would still see Texas. But as we went from 75% of the national average in revenue to 82, 83, something like that. You've got money to spend on schools, health care, those other kind of things, but you haven't crippled your economy. So that's the way 
Uh, I've tried to think about it in that book. Yes, sir. Yeah, a little bit louder if you can, so. Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, and, you know, sadly, the answer is next to nothing, right? Uh, it is continuing to, to be a positive climate uh, for population movement and for uh, business and job growth. And Rick Perry says frequently that the best anti-poverty program around is a good high-paying job. And that is absolutely right. There is no question about that. But how many Texans are qualified for a good high paying job? And it would be wonderful if everybody was. But if the, the question is, are we spending more on education, trying to get from uh, 49, where we were in 2012, 2013 numbers aren't out yet. Uh, historically, we've been up around 38. And by historically, I mean from 1900 to 2000, Texas averaged 38 among the 50 states in per capita education spending. But uh, we didn't have a chance to talk about this, but the late 80s were very difficult uh, in Texas. Major economic collapse. We did a bunch of uh, changes in our revenue and tax system that leave us with a pretty brittle tax structure, not producing enough revenue to serve the state's principal needs and a political class unwilling to, to raise taxes. So we can't spend more on education. We have the highest uninsured population in the country. The country is 15% uninsured. We're 25% uninsured. Obamacare uh, offers uh, a number of ways to cover people without health insurance. And one of those ways is to expand Medicaid which is health insurance for the poor. And in order to get states to do that, the federal government says, we will pay 100% of the cost of expanding Medicaid in your state for three years, and then no less than 90% 10 years out. To which Governor Perry says, no thank you. That is $100 billion that Texas would have to match with about $12 billion of its own money and Governor Perry says, no thanks. Medicaid is a broken system. We're not going to pour $12 billion of our own money into it, even to get $100 billion of yours. So, you know, I mean, what that means is we're not doing what we need to do in education. We're not doing what we need to do in ensuring that people are secure and healthy enough to study hard in school, work hard in their jobs, and, uh, and, uh, and move forward. Uh, and we are only beginning a lot with a lot of other states uh, to do more community college and other kinds of training that is targeted to what uh, the uh, employers in the area need. So I wish I could tell you that we see this problem uh, and are focused on it like a laser and really tearing things up to be sure that we're ready for the middle of the 21st century. Uh, but. Uh, that would be a lie, and Professor Little would catch me in it, and I'd never be invited back. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The age? Oh, age and population. Yeah, let me. Uh, it's really a little bit under five, uh, out here it's going to be something like eight. Uh, so, you know, uh, but if I had uh, put the numbers up and, and I, I didn't want to submerge you in these things, uh, Asians make more than Anglos do, right? So the rise in the Asian population, assuming that Asians continue uh, to get good education and, and have good incomes, will somewhat mediate uh, the slide uh, that uh, would be caused uh, if, if uh, blacks and especially Hispanics don't move up in education and income. And the, the real tragedy here 
is that uh, the state of Texas realizes that the, the educational issues in a diverse state like Texas is just very different than educational issues uh, in, uh, in other states in the country. And the example that I give, if, if, if I lived in a, in a subdivision with 50 houses uh, and my house proved to be uh, in, uh, in a water runoff situation where we're, you got a big thunderstorm, most of the water would come toward my house, not these other 49. Those other 49 people might be fairly sanguine uh, about the drainage system in the neighborhood. I would have to be very energized to do something about that so the water didn't run through my house. That's where Texas is right now. Texas is not alone. New Mexico, Arizona, California is in a very similar situation to Texas. And if you look at Georgia, its Hispanic population is growing rapidly. Uh, Florida is similar, although the Hispanic population is a little bit different. And so, you know, the, the, the Asian population was very, very small up into uh, the 1970s and 80s. A lot of Vietnamese came to the Houston area uh, in the 1970s after the, the Vietnam War and, uh, and other uh, Asians, particularly uh, Indians. Uh, and Chinese, but many, many other countries. Uh, if you go to Richardson, uh, there are some very, very uh, vibrant uh, Asian areas uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth now, but the numbers uh, are relatively uh, smaller. Yes, sir. So, because we have such a high flood of people coming from other states into Texas, doesn't that affect us in a negative way as far as graduation rates and income and things like that? Yeah. That is a, uh, it's a, very, uh, a very good question. One of the things that you hear uh, is that uh, uh, Texas must be doing something right because so many people are moving to Texas. A thousand people a day uh, come to Texas. Uh, but over the course of the last several decades, the, the migration into Texas has been almost 50-50 in migration from the rest of the country and foreign migration from outside the country. So with, with the bulk of the migration, in migration from outside the country, uh, being Mexican Americans uh, into uh, Texas. So we, we are getting a, a lot of people into Texas uh, that is going to make those rates uh, difficult uh, to change. But let me, let me just go off of that onto something I didn't get a chance to mention. That idea that there are a thousand people uh, a, a day moving to Texas is something that Governor Perry uses uh, to say these are a lot of business people bringing their businesses and jobs and other stuff uh, with them, so it's, it's, it's a good thing. But uh, the reason these numbers change the way they do is that the Anglo replacement rate is, is below zero. So the number of Anglo births in Texas is lower than the number of Anglo deaths in Texas. And so that in migration from outside of Texas just holds the number of Anglos in Texas exactly flat. Uh, there is, uh, uh, I think I can without interrupting myself too much, find a table here uh, that I can, yeah, here we go. Uh, today, uh, there are 11.5 million Anglos in Texas. In 2050, there will be 11.5 million Anglos in Texas. In other words, exactly the same number. There will be no increase in Anglo numbers, and to stay flat requires in-migration from the rest of the country. That's why the percentage of the total Texas population goes down rapidly uh, because the Hispanic population in Texas today is 9 million, and in 2040, I don't have this updated, 2050, will be 18.8 .8 million. So the Hispanic raw numbers will double. The Anglo numbers are exactly flat. And the Texas State Data Center at the University of Texas San Antonio 
that puts out these numbers uh, has several estimates, sort of a high estimate, medium, and low estimate for in-migration. And they have, at their median estimate, always underestimated the growth of the Hispanic population. It's been faster than they thought it would be, not slower. So these dynamics, I mean, when you think about projecting out to 2050, you have to be a little skeptical, right? I mean, a lot of stuff can happen between now and 2050. Anglo men and women might start having lots more kids. Unlikely, right? Because that family size allows you to invest in those kids, go to college, that sort of stuff. So not going to happen. The, uh, the migration to Texas from, from Mexico has, has slowed a bit, but the, the family size of Hispanic families, although it's dropping, is larger than Anglo family size, which still leads to this increase even if the migration from Mexico slows. So this is likely to be pretty close. And so the question that was asked earlier about what are we doing to change these things becomes really important. And sadly, the answer is we're not doing much and certainly not doing enough. Yes, sir. Yeah, and the turnover is 50%. Uh, if you uh, hire anybody at all. Yeah, and with the oil fields uh, uh, running strong again, it's very difficult to get people in the prisons. So here's the question. Uh, and add to that the toxic political environment that's not only a part of the country, but definitely a part of Texas. What kind of backlash are you getting for even saying this out loud? Uh, well, you know, one of the great glories of being a tenured full professor uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, there, uh, there are chapters in that book uh, on both the environment and on prisons. Crime in prisons uh, is a fascinating topic uh, uh, to think about why Texas would have the largest prison system uh, uh, in the country and so much larger than, uh, than anyone else is uh, an interesting story, but I've also got a chapter on energy and the environment, which is the presence of the energy industry and the value that it brings to the Texas economy, but also the, uh, uh, and when you hear about the XL pipeline, you know, the one that's going to bring tar sands oil from Texas to the Gulf Coast, we, we harvest a lot of energy in Texas ourselves, but we bring a lot of uh, oil and natural gas from other parts of the country into our refineries and our chemical plants along the Houston Ship Channel. Uh, so we produce uh, fully a quarter of the, the gas and petrochemicals used in the country. And from a Texas perspective, we're doing the rest of the country a favor producing all this energy. From the perspective of the rest of the country, energy production is a dirty business, uh, especially when you burn coal, but even when you when you burn natural gas. And so we always lead uh, in the EPA uh, measurement of various kinds of pollutants into the atmosphere, all the other states in the union. Occasionally, something will blow up in Louisiana, uh, and they will lead for a year. But it's generally Texas with those, those environmental uh, consequences. But think again about the Texas model, the idea that a limited regulatory environment is attractive uh, to business. It seems like a very harsh trade-off to say we're going to have limited regulation to bring in a bunch of these businesses, recognizing that a few of them will blow up, right? But that the cost-benefit calculus is still advantageous. I'd like to point out that you didn't answer the question. You are getting some heat, aren't you? I'm getting what? You're getting some heat. You're getting some backlash. Not to speak of. When, when the book first came out, I told people that I had rented a U-Haul and backed it up to my house and loaded essentials into it, pointed that sucker toward Oklahoma. Uh, but, uh, but, but no, there, there, there is a good bit of debate. The book is used in community colleges uh, and, uh, and four-year colleges 
uh, around Texas. Uh, and you do have to get over the idea that you're being mean about Texas. Uh, and to get into the idea that, you know, if you don't understand this stuff, how can you move in the direction of resolving it in a positive way that will be to the benefit of the state of Texas? It might well be very beneficial uh, to the, the, the key economic and political actors uh, in the state to harvest these benefits from small government and low taxes uh, today. Uh, but it's not in the long-term interest of the state not to have enough revenue to do decent education for every Texan. Uh, and Judge Dietz is going to say, look, we've told you guys a number of times you've got to change this, uh, and there will be a change, uh, but it'll be modest and, and we'll be back in court on education uh, five or six years from now. Hypothetically, you know, since I don't foresee Texas's you know oil climate allowing really anything to harm one of our primary industries, I mean, <coughs> will you know will Texas al allow that to change? I mean, will we make changes on our end to subsidize any changes if they were to actually pass through it? You know, in you know the national level. Yeah, there's a story in the Dallas Morning News this morning uh, on a, a negotiated agreement between Texas and the EPA, the Environmental uh, Protection Agency of the federal government. Uh, and we've been in a fight back and forth with the EPA for decades. One of the things that Greg Abbott says uh, every time uh, he talks to an audience in his campaign for governor is that his job is I go into the office in the morning, I sue the federal government, and I go home. He's currently the attorney general, the chief legal officer of the state. And so that's been the attitude uh, of Greg Abbott and Rick Perry about the federal government, but that they're trying to drive uh, costs into Texas business where they should be grateful for all this energy uh, that we're producing. The, the federal government pushed back strongly enough uh, to take control of some of the biggest polluters and set the standards themselves. Uh, but there is a, now a negotiated settlement in which Texas has moved somewhat in the direction of the federal government, but, uh, but not all the way. And, you know, we really do want our principal industries to be healthy and vibrant and productive. So the question is where that place is that allows our industries to be healthy and productive but still sanitary and, and secure. So we don't want stuff blowing up and we don't want stuff uh, blowing through the air. Think of that West Virginia thing over the course of the last two or three months where there's this, this chemical spill into the Elk River that feeds water into the state capital of, of West Virginia. Uh, and uh, the, the tank rusted, some noxi noxious stuff went out into the river and people drank it. So. You know, you do have to have regulation, but it is also possible to regulate so much that you limit and constrict the business climate. We don't do that. We limit too little. There's room to go, just like there is on taxes, to get to a healthier balance. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, when you have a big company like Boeing uh, saying they're going to build a new plant, uh, it becomes a feeding, feeding frenzy among the 50 states to give them as, as attractive a package uh, as possible. So what you do is, is you, you give them an abatement on, on sales tax, you give them a reduction of property taxes for 20, 30 years, uh, but they might bring a thousand jobs and the income from those thousand jobs, those guys are going to be paying the sales tax and, and property tax. But there can be a race to the bottom. States can compete so hard with each other uh, that they get uh, a, uh, a new business that might have real zero impact on the economic climate because they paid so much for it. 
So it is possible to give way too much. And, and we need to be clear. This idea that Texas has a positive business climate is very real. What you never hear is that Texas has a positive worker climate. And that's, and you don't hear it because they don't, right? Texas does take the view that if you attract enough businesses, they will bring jobs and people will benefit by that. But there are lots of ways to try to create a better balance between the profitability of businesses and the productivity of workers. And part of that is education, healthcare security, transportation. You don't think about it, but it is bad for business if, if workers can't get to work in a timely way and get home and you can't move raw materials to your factory and finish products to the place to sell them, right? If you got too much traffic, you got bad roads, uh, it, it detracts from the business climate and we're getting to that point. So again, there, there are seven or eight policy chapters in that book and rather than try to touch on all of them, I just hit a couple uh, major themes. But uh, uh, your uncle, if you got a crazy uncle who bothers people at Thanksgiving uh, about, uh, about Texas or politics in general, you want to buy that book and send it to him so that next Thanksgiving uh, you can rebut his crazy claims. Mark, one last question. Who's yeah, going? Clark. Okay. I just, I, I mean, I think that, like, if you look at the graduation rate for the people in the workforce, 92 and 86 are relatively high numbers, right? So it's just like, and then whatever age it is. So my question or statement I guess is, is like, you know, I think that every one of those races, when you go into school, you get the same assignment, you hear the same lecture, and two of three of them are graduating at a higher rate so I just in my opinion I just think you're all doing the same old business but just one or two are slacking off so I don't see the point of throwing more money at education when 92 percent isn't bad so, yeah. so I'm just saying I don't really see the point of throwing more money at it if people are already thriving and just some people aren't yeah right the, these uh, these are near the national average up here uh, this is a little bit above this is a little bit below this is this is uh, 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 also a little bit below. Uh, but that, that case that I mentioned in Judge Dietz's classroom, the claim made by the school district is that the funding is inadequate and uh, inequitable. Inadequate means not enough money going to the schools. And you can contest that. You, you can say that even though it's 49th, it is adequate. Inequitable is that different school districts get different levels of funding because schools are funded generally on local property taxes. And so in all of those school uh, uh, funding cases, it's a question of whether, uh, and these are famous Edgewood ISD uh, in, uh, in the San Antonio area, uh, might have $70,000 in property value for every student. And Alamo Heights, which is the Highland Park of the San Antonio area, would have $700,000. And so Alamo Heights can have a low property tax and still generate more money than can Edgewood ISD. So the inequitable aspect of it is that most Texas schools uh, are majority one race or another. They're majority Anglo, majority black or majority Hispanic, sometimes big majorities. And it's the majority minority schools that have the lowest funding level. So if it were true that everybody of the three races is coming into the classroom uh, and getting the same assignment, hearing the same lecture, and some are working hard and others aren't, then it is an issue of personal responsibility. But that's not the case. It is a difference in funding as well. And given those graduation rates, uh, if you've got a more difficult problem uh, in low income uh, and minority schools, Presumably, you wouldn't be putting less money behind that. You'd be putting more money behind it if you wanted to make sure that the job got done. So those two things, uh, inequitable and not enough, different. Thank you. All right. Do good and then come see us down on the hilltop.